in session. Super excited for today on this dreary Monday to be talking with Lauren Dudley Stevens of Dudley Stevens. And I think all of you are going to have a great time hearing about her expertise. Just a couple of quick announcements before we get started with our interview. Um, as a reminder, lecture prep questions are blank due to me before class. And then uh, you must answer one of the questions during class. Keep it on the same email chain and send me back a reply after class. Um, attendance questions are asked at the end of the lecture. Actually, today is going to be a mid-semester survey. So the link will be posted in uh, on here as well. I will shoot you an email as well when we get set up. Um, and as a reminder, if you would like to have some one-on-one -on -one career advice sessions with me, uh, the sign up sheet is here. So we, there's a lot of space left in November or December if you want to go over a resume or talk about what you're going to do in next year or in January, depending on when you graduate. Just a reminder of our social media sites, both faces and places on Facebook, as well as YouTube, and then my Instagram handle, uh, Prof. Caroline FIT. Uh, follow along. Um, so remote guidelines is a refresher, especially because I see some, some new names out there. If you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order. I just request that any questions that get asked in the middle of my interview are particularly relevant to what we're talking about, where, like you need clarification, technology is not working, anything like that. Um, you can also ch type them in the chat function and I will uh, follow along and see those there. Uh, however, your questions that you want to ask Lauren yourself, please wait till the end of my interview so that we can um, do that all at once. If you're speaking, please turn on your camera, and if you raise your hand, please preemptively turn on your camera so we can prevent a gap from when you are called on to when you start speaking. And please only unmute when you are beginning to speak. And just as a reminder, this class is being recorded. Quick flash of our schedule. Um, especially the next upcoming weeks. Uh, next week, we have on another uh, two co-founders that are joining us from Chakra and Up. Really excited to have them on. As, and then the following week, we have Sarah Tosetti, who is a costume designer. Um, but she is on the other side of costume design. She is um, on the stage, so both in Paris and she's located here in Brooklyn. Uh, and the week following that, another co-founder, Fran Dunaway, is joining us from Tomboy X. Does anyone have any questions before I get started? I didn't give you a chance before. Okay, great. Well, with that, I would love to introduce you guys to Lauren Dudley Stevens. She is the co founder and chief executive officer at Dudley Stevens. A co founder and CEO and the face of Dudley Stevens, Lauren manages product design, styling, branding, and marketing, strategic partnerships, and the creative execution of the brand. Her vision and expertise are complemented by years of prior experience in celebrity dressing and VIP relations for leading fashion houses, Calvin Klein and Gucci. In developing the Dudley Stevens collection, Lauren combines her essential classic style sensibility with an instinctive understanding of customers' preferences. As a mother of two children, George and Elle, Lauren believes that good style and versatility for modern women can and should be synonymous. You shouldn't have to choose between looking chic and feeling comfortable, she says. Our brand was built on the idea that we should have both. Lauren lives in Greenwich, Connecticut with her family. She holds a BA from Duke University. Please join me in welcoming Lauren. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Oh. Is my, hold on. You can hear me now? You're off mute. Hmm. Hold on. Another speaker? Any uh, problem? Oh, I can hear her. Okay. I can hear. It's a me problem. I try. It looks like I'm on, but. Yeah, we are here. Who are you? I can hear our professor. One second. I can't seem to hear you. Can you say something again, again Lauren? Yeah, I can I can hear you okay. Not coming through. I can hear you. 
so weird. Um, looking on my settings too. Okay, so I'm obviously having an issue. I'm gonna quickly hop off and hop back on. I'll be right back. Okay, sounds good. Is this working now? Can you hear me? Is that better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. That was so weird because I had you before. I heard you and then
weird. I'm so sorry, everyone. No problem. Um, all right. Well, what I was going to kick off with was to ask you to tell us a little bit more about your career path. Yes. Before, before starting your business and then launching your own business. So yeah, so I um, graduated in 2003 uh, from Duke University and um, got a job out of college in advertising actually. So in a totally different industry, um, I started out, it seems like ages ago, well it was a long time ago, but um, but yeah, I started out in advertising, um, which I did want to touch upon that um, I was there for two years and it, even though I was working on like Johnson & Johnson accounts, so in consumer products, um, I really learned how to market and how to advertise and promote a product and speak to consumers in a way that I think then going into the fashion industry kind of set me off down this path of really understanding how to speak to speak to your your audience really. So um, even though it was an entirely different industry, it was some of the best experience I think I could have had at you know 21, 22, 23 um, years old. So I started um, in advertising and um, you know part of one thing I always tell people, and that is kind of an obvious, but you know, networking is the most important thing that you can do um, when you're looking for jobs. And I just got very lucky and was, you know, with a friend one evening and met this woman who happened to be the head of communications for Calvin Klein. And you know, I knew that I would want to work in fashion if I had the opportunity, um, but I didn't have any experience in it at the time. But I just figured I would give her my business card and she actually said they were hiring in their in-house advertising department at Calvin. So she gave, she actually gave me her business card as well. And then the next morning I sent her my resume and went in for an interview and, and got the job working um, in-house in the advertising department at Calvin. So, um, so it was kind of a foot in the door into the fashion industry um, that I think you know, it was definitely a lot of luck and just being in the right place at the right time. But, um, but you know, networking and your, your, even just your immediate network. I mean, this was a woman that one of my best friends introduced me to. So, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. Um, and I know it's a different time right now with COVID, but there's still chances to network and, you know, set up phone calls and Zooms and, and all that. So it's still important, I think. Um, and yeah, so then I spent some time at Calvin in the in-house ad agency department. Um, and then a job opened up in the PR department um, on the celebrity uh, celebrity PR team. And I was 24 at the time. And what? how cool does that sound? I mean, who wouldn't want that job <laughs> at 24 yeah. years old? So, um, you know, I saw it come up on like the HR board at Calvin and I emailed my HR contact and I just said, I would love to be considered for this job. And, you know, she said that they don't typically do, you know, uh, Cross department transfers, but they would consider it. And so there, some time went by, and I met with the woman that would become my boss, and we really hit it off. And um, she ended up hiring me for that job. So I, I went. I mean, I just did a 180. Like it was advertising at Calvin, which at the time was um, all about branding and licensing, because Calvin, um, you know, obviously licensed out a lot of his his name basically to these other manufacturers. So our job at the in-house agency was to make sure. Calvin Klein was being um, portrayed in the right way, whether it was on a signage in Macy's or on an advertisement billboard in Times Square for Calvin Klein jeans. So we would make sure that the logo and the branding and all of that was consistent across the board. So, you know, I went from doing that to literally, you know, I, my first day on the job in the PR department at Calvin, a stylist called yelling at me for a dress. And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> like this is my first day. Um, so I, yeah, it was a bit of a change, but um, but it was exciting and you know a whirlwind. And I, you know, it was a grueling job. It was long hours, and I traveled a lot. Um, but it was you know so rewarding, and I met fascinating people, and I worked with you know name a celebrity, and I probably came into interaction with them at some point. Um, so I was at Calvin for a few years, and then I left and went to Gucci, doing the same thing. Um, dressing celebrities, um, lots of Oscars, award show, that sort of thing. Um, we actually, while I was at Gucci, we had a really big event. Um, it was a UNICEF fundraiser with Madonna. She was like the host of it. And um, they set out and it was hosted at the United Nations. And that was the biggest event, I think, of my career, like looking back. I mean, we dressed 50 celebrities or more. I think it was even like wow. 60 
in the end. And um, and my job was coordinating all of the fittings, making sure no one showed up wearing the same thing, styling all of the the fittings out, um, you know, down to from handbags to jewelry to dresses and shoes and everything, and then getting them there too. Like I had to get their car services and get them there. So. That event, I, I used to joke, it took a year off my life. Like it was really <laughs> the most stressful events, but it was, it was amazing. And it was, you know, I just remember thinking at the time, like I'll never have another experience like this. And I, I think it, it's true. So, um, so I was at Gucci and then um, I went back to Calvin actually in a more senior role um, as a celebrity PR um, manager at that time. So, um, so I was back at Calvin, which I was just so excited to be back in house um, doing, you know, the cool thing about working at a, a New York City based fashion company is that you're exposed to the design team um, firsthand. So, you know, whereas at Gucci, everyone was in, in Milan. So I had less exposure to that side while I was at Gucci in New York City. But at Calvin, you know, I would go up to our designers offices and, and I got to be in fittings while they were making these custom gowns for celebrities. And um, so it was, you know, it was very it was just a lot more in the moment being there and and seeing everything in real time and and I think I learned so much just about design that you know I, I didn't have I didn't have that background so um, you know I got to understand how fittings work and and fitting a garment to a body and and you know lab dips for color and fabric research and I I just was I witnessed all of that and was even had a hand in some of it at certain points and so. Um, you know, I, it just was a great exposure that I, I don't think I would have had many other places. So, um, so it was, it was a great, you know, I was there doing that for, I think about three years towards the end of like my corporate world. And then, um, I got a job offer at Longcomb, um, which is owned by L'Oreal. So I switched to the beauty industry, which was such an exciting, um, opportunity because my boss at the time was like, look, we, we, they were actually just about to sign a deal with Jason Wu to do like a collaboration with Lancome and Jason Wu. So they hired me with wow. the, yeah, with the understanding that bringing fashion experience, you know, to the beauty industry was what they wanted to do. So, so it was the right fit for, for the job. And, um, and the beauty industry was, you know, it almost felt like I was going back to my advertising experience. Cause it was like, kind of understanding product, you know, consumer products and, and marketing, which is a whole different ball game than fashion in certain oh, ways. Right. So, so yeah, so I, I was at Longcomb for about a year and a half um, before I quit and then started Dudley Stevens. Awesome. And uh, tell us, tell us a little bit about that, about getting your business off the ground. Yeah. So I, I was working in the beauty industry and I think, you know, I, I, I really, it was so beneficial to to work there and, but what I realized was that it just wasn't for me long term. And so I thought, you know, OK, I don't want to be working. I don't want to do beauty for you know the rest of my career. Um, so what you know, what what's the next step then? You know, where do I go from here? Um, and I really you know, I've I've always wanted to start my own business. Um, you know, and Kaki and I, my sister and my mom and I have started the business together and we, we just always wanted to start a family business that, you know, it was always a, a passion and just kind of something we talked about constantly. So at that time it was kind of like now or never, you know, I didn't have kids yet. I had just gotten married. Um, are you, can you hear me? Okay. You can hear me. Okay. Yeah, I can. I'm sorry. I'm on my iPad, so I'm not used to navigating. I'm trying to like, Totally. I know. I just want to make sure. Going on with it, but yeah. I know that my internet wasn't you. going on. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I um, just figured it was now or never. And it was, you know, I'm going to just go for it and yeah. leave the corporate world and just, and just make the leap. Um, so this was in 2014 or 15, sorry, early 2015 that I left. And two days later, basically woke up and told my husband I was going to start a fleece clothing company. I think he thought I was crazy. <laughs> and now look at you. Yeah, I guess. Um, do you feel like there's anything that you studied in college that set you up for success? So I think um, I had a minor in English and marketing. It was a dual minor. And I took a class under the, the marketing umbrella that was an entrepreneurship class my senior year. And um, I think that that experience in that class was 
so beneficial for my career um, where, to where I, to get to where I am now. Um, it kind of, are you still there, Carrie? I am. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm just fiddling to make my internet better, but I'm here. I'm listening. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> can you um, hear me? Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, that, that, that class um, okay. really set me up. Um, you know, it, it kind of planted a seed. It was my senior year and it was, you know, I, I really feel like it, there, there was a kind of one of the overarching messages during one of the lectures was, um, you know, if you have an idea and you're, you're, you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to start your own company and you have an idea, you should always know that someone else has probably has the same idea and has either already started the company or is about to start the company. And I feel like that was something that I, I thought about constantly. And especially when we were launching Dudley Stevens, because it really sets you up to think like, okay, how am I going to differentiate myself and how are we going to tell our story and, you know, really make it um, impactful and, and, you know, communicate. And I think it's, it goes with, without saying that it just means that, you know, you can make a t-shirt or a, you know, a fleece coat, like we make or whatever, but it, what really matters is the story and, and the marketing behind it. And so I think that was kind of the ultimate, like that, that class really kind of stuck with me to this day too. I think about it a lot. Oh, that's great. Um, tell us, I know there are a lot of students that are actually very interested in celebrity dressing. And I know you just went into it a little bit, some of your highlights and stuff, but can you tell us what the week in the, in a life of a celebrity dresser looks like? Yeah. So, um, it was, you know, I, I did everything from, um, dressing celebrities for, a movie premiere, you know, a smaller movie premiere in New York City or um, anywhere from that to the Oscars. So depending on the time of year, you know, we were most days at Calvin, we had like a, our own celebrity atelier where they made all the custom dresses and just anything that was needed for celebrity. And then they also had, we had a whole fit room that we used that was just this beautiful space that anytime, you know, a celebrity or, or you know, a well-known person or, you know, just anyone needed a luxurious experience um oh, cool. they, they would come there and so and at gucci was the same way we had you know a whole like celebrity suite where they would get you know welcomed into and we would we would have fittings with them so um you know i managed that room and i managed all the, the samples that we had and all the runway samples and the custom dresses that were made um i dealt with celebrity stylists on a daily basis um and our publicists and agents as well um which was you know such an interesting experience and kind of getting a glimpse into that world which is just its own you know it's its own world really and it's it's very you know oh, i can imagine yeah and it, so uh, so i got to learn a little bit about that world and the celebrity world um and hollywood and all that but um but yeah, really like a typical week was I would have definitely have at least a fitting a day. I mean, at that time, it, celebrity dressing at Calvin was a big, a big initiative for them. And they put a lot of, you know, dollars behind the department and, and really supported us in, you know, our outreach and, and just all of our operations. So we had fittings constantly where I would be styling out everything down from pulling runway samples and, and shoes and, and bags and that is definitely the most fun part about it, or at least I found that to be the most fun part. Um, and then it was kind of just outreach to celebrity stylists and their publicists to see what movies premieres they had coming up. I always had to know, you know, the, the up and coming actors and actresses as well. Um, I also had to see their movies and be able to speak to them and, and really understand who they were and, um, and know the like cool people and like the up and coming people. So that was a big part of it was just researching and kind of staying in the know on things and, um, yeah, and kind of, you know, just in PR, especially in fashion PR relationships are just the number one, you know, who you know and who you can call when you're in a crisis or, you know, who you can lean on if you need something um, is just the key. So it was all about, you know, developing those relationships with the celebrity stylists and and really kind of nurturing them and, and, um, and, and then the fittings and going to all these events at night too. It was a lot of nighttime stuff, which, you know, I knew was not going to be conducive to motherhood where I'm now and you know so it was just it was definitely like I a bet. great yeah experience to have in your 20s you know when you don't have too many obligations yet with children and all that so <laughs> but yeah but it was it was definitely an intense time for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah I can imagine and a lot of people are obviously based out of LA right so probably a lot of 
cycle. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I traveled to LA every award season. We would go out for the Golden Globes and Oscars. Um, I went to the south of France um, a handful of times also for the Cannes Film Festival, which was absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, we were staying in these like amazing places and um, every year Calvin at the time was doing a sponsored event there where it was um, to, I think most of the years it was, um, they were launching like a new perfume. So it would be this big party to launch this perfume during the Cannes Film Festival. And we would have, our job was to find celebrity talent to come, you know, get them there, fly them there, get them in a hotel, dress them. The whole time they were there, they would have to wear Calvin, even if they were just leaving to go get a coffee, like they would photograph. So it was like, you know, every outfit had to be planned out, styled um, and taken care of. And, and then I would go and be there and, you know, and then it was fun too, because we got to go to the event and all that. But, um, but it was one of, you know, some of the most intense trips that I've ever taken in terms of exhaustion and just, you know, not knowing what day it is and time, like the time difference. Wow. But, um, <laughs> but it was, it was such a, you know, those sorts of things though. It's like, you really, you know, um, get, you go through them and it just, you learn so much and you, it just makes you a stronger person when it comes to, you know, anything else that starting a business or your career can, can, you know, come in your way. You just, you're ready to take it on. That's great. Um, it, it is uh, interesting the lessons that you picked up along the way, even if it's not relevant to what you're doing now, obviously the work ethic and all of that. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, so what did you, when you started your own company, what was the hardest part about getting it started? You know, did, did you have a hard time finding production contacts yeah. and things like that? Yeah, so I would say, I mean, I, you know, I spent all of this time working in, in marketing and in PR um, and advertising and with, you know, marketing degree from school. And um, so I really felt when we were about to launch our company that, you know, telling our story and getting our, our message out, I was not worried about. Like, I felt, you know, prepared and excited because we had this great, you know, concept for a business we had we developed the brand out I mean my whole family my mom my sister and I we all have marketing backgrounds and my dad and so we we just were we took that and we ran with it and we felt really passionate about it but in terms of design and production you know those were areas where as I said like I had exposure to design when I was at Calvin but like not you know I didn't have a degree in design you know I didn't and especially with production too which is its own its own industry, you know, I just, I didn't have the resources. So, um, you know, my mom and I, we found a pattern maker in Connecticut and we went and we had samples made with this woman. And, and really, I think what it, I, it was really just about, it almost was worked to our favor that we didn't know very much because we would just make decisions and get it, you know, do things and make it happen in a way that I think if we had known too much, we might not have done it. So it's like, I, I feel like I've heard other yeah. entrepreneurs say that too. Like sometimes it's better not to know too much. So, you know, we kind of just like took it and ran with it. Um, I did use a website called makersrow.com, which is a really great resource for uh, local um, production and, and really wow. a lot of things, but, but that's where we found our factory. I mean, I found this factory, they were, I was living in Brooklyn at the time and they were 10 minutes from my apartment and so I just thought, wow, like if this factory might be interested in working with us, like maybe, you know, it would be so convenient. So I, um, he took a meeting with us. And I think that, you know, at that point, my fashion background definitely helped because he believed that we knew what we were doing and we did, we knew what we were doing, but we, you know, we just didn't have the production resources that someone else, you know, might have with that, with more experience in that. So, um, it was, that website was hugely helpful. Um, and then you know, I reached out to a few factories and, and this one took a meeting with us and he believed in our idea and he said, I think it's a good idea. And he just, you know, kind of he took us on as a client and we've been with him since day one. So, you know, I can't, I can't say, you know, I think, yeah, one of your questions I think was also, um, you know, local USA manufacturing and I would have yeah. to say, for, yeah, for anyone starting out, um, I would definitely recommend that because you know, going overseas and importing, you deal with high minimums, tariffs, you know, importing things into the country. 
And with staying local, you know, you can find factories. There's quite a few now that do small runs of, of production uh, quantities. So, you know, you don't need to make thousands of, thing, of, st of pieces. You can make 300. Sometimes even some factories will let you make 50 or 100. So, you know, we, we learned early on that smaller production was the way to go. So we just started really small. And I would tell that to anyone who's launching their own business. And keep it local. <laughs> That's great advice. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like um, I've heard that from a number of entrepreneurs too. It's to kind of go with what you know and get that going really, really well before you get too crazy with branching out into other yes. areas. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely, you know, when you're getting started, I think the best advice that we were given was start small and have a great story and, and know how to get your idea out there. Cause you know, you could have a thousand units of something, but no marketing and no story and no one's going to buy them. So it's like, you kind of need both to go at the same time and, and you don't want to start out too big. You know, it's just, it could be, could be too, then it's just way too risky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could that. Um, I apologize if I'm coming in weird to you because I see that your video is off from your voice. So I'm sure I, my reactions are a little delayed oh, and I apologize. No, no problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> tell us what's the best part about running your own company. Though. So I would say the best part um, would definitely be um, having, you know, my own schedule throughout the day um, as much as I can. I mean, you know, as we've been growing, it's harder and harder to make you know carve out time during the day but um but it's definitely you know something that as a mom as a working mom you know i feel so blessed to have that and you know to be able to kind of duck out and and see the kids when i when i can and have a little bit of flexibility there i think is 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 really great um and that's like on the personal side but on the business side you know i i do think of myself as a creative person and i just having that creative outlet and and being able to you know, kind of explore things that if you have an idea and just run with it, it's, it's just so gratifying and, and exciting. And, um, you know, it's, if you can start a company and it becomes, you know, successful and you're able to, you know, actually take a salary one day, which was a big moment when that happened for us. Like it's, it's definitely very, you know, it's exciting. And I, I do hope, you know, for my kids too, that like, you're setting an example of how to, you know, that you can do it. And even though you're a female founded company, like it's possible. And, um, and I think, you know, I think that's, it's definitely being able to set that example is just such a nice thing to do with this company. So hopefully, you know, we can keep doing it, keep, keep setting that example. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> that's great. Um, so yeah, actually I, I wanted to ask you more about launching your own company with young children. I think, um, you know, what, what type of opportunities and challenges did that pose for you? Yeah. So I, um, we launched our company right when, um, I was having kids and my sister also, who is my, or one of, you know, our, my mom and my sister and I are all co-founders of the company. And, um, so it was a little crazy. <laughs> quite honestly. Um, we, you know, it, the best part about it was that we really, you know, had each other to lean on throughout it all. Um, you know, I, I think without, without having them and kind of, you know, cause I literally had my daughter in 2017 and we were at two years old as a company at that point. So, you know, taking maternity leave was not really an option because we didn't have a team yet. It was just my sister and I. So, you know, I just have memories of like, I was in my home office with my sister, like holding my newborn while we were having a meeting about something or, or discussing something. And um, so it's, you know, that it was definitely tricky and, and definitely not, you know, it was difficult. I can't, I can't lie. It was, there were hard moments where I was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this because it's, you know, <laughs> raising, having kids is like the biggest challenge of, of a lifetime. So, um, but, you know, we just, we're so, we still are so passionate about the company and the idea and the concept. And so, you know, there was never a doubt that it was going to, we were going to keep, we were going to, you know, keep going and that, 
that it would be successful. I mean, we just thought from day one, like this would be a great company. And so, um, so yeah, so I think that it definitely was difficult and tricky, but it's possible and you just kind of make it work. And I think honestly, like having, um, having a child is so, is such a big thing and so challenging that it, honestly, I feel like you can do anything. <laughs> like, I feel like it gave me the confidence to just kind of say like, I'm not, I'm not scared of, of anything after that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's really great. Can I, I'm just going to try one more thing with my computer because I feel so yeah, bad about this lag. Just give me one second. Okay, no problem. Right back. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. I'm hoping this is better. Okay, great. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Okay. No problem. Um, so elephant in the room and something we've obviously been talking about all semester is COVID and kind of how people have had to adapt to make it through this weird time. Um, yes. Any big adjustments that you guys have had to make? Yeah, so we, you know, since we make everything uh, locally, we still make everything in Brooklyn and they were the hardest hit by all of this and especially at the height of everything. So, yeah. um, you know, our factory shut down and it was, it was really, I mean, I have to say I spent a few days just kind of feeling like I got hit by a truck because here we are yeah. you know, just like this growing, thriving company. And then overnight our production, our supply chain shuts down. So, um, you know, it was, and, and on top of that, our entire marketing plan for that year, we just looked down the road and we just said, well, this is not, we can't, we can't, this is all has to change now. So um, we had to spend, you know, a week or, or longer, just pivot, totally pivoting. I mean, we changed our marketing plan. We changed our, our production plan. Um, we re, we re we looked at our sales plan, our projections again, and kind of tried to be more conservative. Um, and we just had to kind of look inwards to our our employees who work with us and and what we had you know like the inventory that we had and just kind of get creative and and I, we always use the word scrappy and just figure <laughs> out okay how are we going to continue to sell and and keep the doors open you know the the virtual the <laughs> yeah keep the lights on and keep, keep the doors open of our of our online of our website um Thankfully, our factory was able to fulfill orders uh, once or once a week during the height of everything. They would send one person in, and then you know as things got better, they were able to send more you know two people in and, and safely. And and so you know our whole thing from the beginning was we don't want anyone to feel unsafe or be unsafe. So let's just take a step back and you know reevaluate and figure out like how are we going to do this safely. Um, and the owner, we worked really closely with the owner of our factory to navigate during that time. And um, it was just a really weird time. And we, we, you know, thankfully we did have inventory to sell and it was, it was mid-March. So it was, you know, still cold and gross weather, especially in the Northeast. And, um, and we just, and people wanted to be cozy at home. So yeah, our, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, we noticed a, a lag in sales just naturally because we've had less 
you know, news and less marketing going on. Um, but we were still selling stuff. I mean, our, our sales really did not, did not go down as much as we thought that they might. So we were able to, to get through it. And, um, and I have to say our team at that time just helped us so much and just came up with creative things to do and speak to. And, you know, how do we change our whole marketing messaging, you know, that we had planned a year before that we had set up and now yeah. we had to completely change it. So, uh, so it was a lot of, it was a huge pivot and it was a lot of work to switch things around and, and kind of go in a different direction. And, um, but we got through it and two and a half months later, um, the factory reopened as soon as New York city manufacturing was able to reopen, they were able to go back in, you know, knock on wood safely and, um, and, you know, with a pretty limited staff in the beginning, but, um, but they just got to, you know, hit the ground running with our fall production. And, and we just said, okay, if you guys can stay open and things are safe and, you know, we can make our fall, our fall line, um, you know, hopefully we'll be okay. And, and I have to say like that there was a lot of pent up demand because we, we yeah. operate, we have a, what we, like what everyone in the industry knows is a product drop um, strategy where, you know, we have new styles that we garner and we get excitement for, and then we drop them on a certain day. And so we didn't have that when our factory was closed because we didn't have new products coming out. So that, but it, it was, it almost was like a blessing because we had all of this demand built up during COVID, you know, because people were dropping our core stuff and like the basics we had, but the minute we started dropping these new styles, they were just selling out. Like anytime we dropped things and wow. we were like, we were we were so excited because we were like, okay, so clearly people, you know, our customers did not leave us. They're still there. And they're, they were, everyone was so supportive during the time of, you know, even when our orders, we would have our, at one point, our orders were two weeks delayed. So if someone placed an order online, they weren't going to get it for two weeks. And usually our shipping. <laughs> the worst yeah. thing. These days, right? <laughs> yes, I know. These days it's wrong, but I have to say that during COVID, like our, customers were so understanding and they just said like, don't you get it to me when you can, they understood. So, um, you know, we were just so thankful and, and felt fortunate that people stuck by us. And then, you know, when we were able to get back up and running and, and back to our product drops and, and bringing out our new stuff, they were ready to shop. And it's been, you know, since then we've caught up with our sales projects, our previous sales projections before COVID we've now reached. So awesome. So yeah, so we're, we're back up and, and caught up with where we thought we would be. So knock on wood through the fall and winter, but I yeah. think our, yeah, yeah, our, our product is serves COVID well, like it's being home totally. and yeah, yeah. Still, still feel put together, but be cozy and comfortable and around the house. So, so we're, yeah, we're, yeah. You're, getting, for that. you're getting a larger audience because a lot more people are doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That's great. Uh, just a logistical question. Do you, does your production company ship right from there to your yeah. customers? Yes. Oh, that's a really oh. unique model that you like never yeah. take it in yourself and push it back out again. Exactly. So we, so the factory that we launched with in 2015, we've grown, they've grown with us and they've really, awesome. yeah, we, um, it's almost a, it's a partnership at this point. Um, and they, they offered to do our fulfillment, which we were a little hesitant about, but, um, but we just thought, you know, how, how beneficial to have real time answers for customers. If a package is lost, if they get the wrong thing, which happened with direct consumer shipping. I mean, yeah. that's, you, there's, there's actually a fairly high percentage of customers in the world of online orders that receive the wrong item. So there's always human error and things that happen. And so we have real time answers and, you know, we can get back the customers so quickly with fixing things or answering questions or, or just customer or any customer service inquiries and having that like firsthand interaction is just, we find very valuable and, um, yeah. and we're hoping, you know, we can continue to, that they will continue to grow with us and, and continue with that. Cause it just, it's, it's just awesome to have that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, um, where is your main office? usually is it in Connecticut or yeah so our main office is in Greenwich um where I live um, my sister lives in Darien and my mom lives in Rowayton and the girls that work with us all kind of live in Connecticut and, and some in New York City depending on COVID <laughs> um but yeah but we're we're based in Greenwich um so actually to, to also speak to COVID as well so we moved into a space in town um it's almost two years ago now and it was meant to be a showroom office space um, and so we 
decorated it and set it up to be this beautiful, welcoming, warm, like cozy um, room and space. Um, and we had events there and we would have press appointments or, you know, whatever the day entailed. And our whole team was, was you know, that was our headquarters. Um, and it still is. But during COVID, we all, you know, as everyone was working remotely. So um, we decided that we had, you know, this beautiful space is sitting there. And my sister and I were still using it occasionally because being that we were sisters, like we were kind of quarantining together anyway. So we would meet there occasionally to kind of get out of our houses and like, <laughs> kind of like get some quiet time to try yeah. to get work done so but this beautiful space is there and so we just thought okay um we need to open it as a store it's you know as and now you know things are reopened in connecticut it's a limited capacity in our space but with a mask and you know distance shopping we just thought wait we have this beautiful space let's just set it up as a store so we opened it um in mid-september um as wow. a store so it's half a store and half office at the moment. Um, and we'll see how it goes, but our plan is to stay open through, you know, till right after the holidays and then we'll we'll reevaluate. Yes. Yeah, but it's going very well. Cool. It's a very neat yeah. success story coming out of COVID that you were actually able to launch a store in this. Yeah, time. totally. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Customers who are so loyal love the fact that they can get in there and touch and feel. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, but that's all we've heard is that, you know, people really want to come in and, and even for new customers that don't know their size, it's just so nice to have a spot locally where they can go. And yeah. you know, we've had, had people driving in from an hour away just to like come in and try on to get their yeah. size. So yeah, once that that's another thing about COVID is that anyone is looking for an outing like that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I know, and we heard that. We're like, okay, wait, maybe people, you know, want to come in and, and yeah. experience the brand in, in real life too. You yeah. Know? And there's there's pent up demand for in store shopping for sure. I would say yes, At least totally. If I'm any representation. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so you you mentioned that you have been able you have hired people over the years. How, how big is your team now? So we have um, ten people working with us, um, and it's a mixture of freelance and full time employees. But um, but yeah, we have we have ten people. And then we have um, agencies that we work with also, like a web development agency, social media advertising agency. Um, but pretty much, you know, everyone we have that we that work with us, they all have, you know, specific uh, tasks and, and kind of like, I hate to call it departments because it's not like we have lots of people, but like their own department is kind of their, their responsibility. And obviously as a small company, everything overlaps and, and we all pitch in where we need to, but. Very cool. That's, and how, so how are you um, structured? If obviously we went over what you're, you do yourself, but I know your mother and your sister are involved. So. Yeah. So um, my sister, so everyone always asks like, also, how do you work with family and your sister too? Awesome. You know? I wish I worked with my sisters. That'd be so fun. <laughs> so some people say that and some people yeah. say I could never. So it's like one or the other. Um, but my sister, Kaki and I, you know, we always say that we have very different strengths and weaknesses that, balance each other out really well and and you know more than being sisters we just mesh really well together and and we you know appreciate that about each other um and my mom has like an amazing creative eye for things and fit and kind of trend forecasting and colors and all that so you know between the pr marketing background that i had that i brought to the table and then my mom's creative design areas and then my sister with like her like khaki literally built our website when we launched from, I mean, I don't know how she did it, but all of a sudden we had a website. So it was like, yeah. we all kind of just came, wow. yeah, we brought all of our, our like expertise to the table and kind of brought them all together. And, and it, it, it was good in the beginning. And it, it's still to this day, as we've grown, like, you know, Khaki's taken on even more when it comes to like logistics and, and all that and marketing. I mean, she built out our entire loyalty program last year, um, wow. which has just been amazing. And our loyal customers, love it and they can shop for points on our website and they get great rewards and so it's um little things like that that i honestly would never have thought to do or know how to do so it's like it's great to yeah. have a business partner that can complement you know what your strengths and weaknesses are yeah i think that's another thing that i hear on here a lot from people is know what you don't know and find yes. those people that kind of mesh in with you so that exactly you yes exactly um, one of the trickiest parts of launching a business for sure yeah totally <laughs> Um, well, I, lo I love hearing about different companies, particularly right now, that are not located in, in New York City, because I think there is this kind of 
unrest about what the next couple of years are going to look like as far as, um, you know, where, where fashion is located. So it's really cool that you yeah. guys this business thrive in another location. Yeah. And- in a location that really suits your particular company, I think, I personally think. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. I mean, I think that's, you know, part of our, what we always, you know, since the beginning, just kind of conveying our message and our brand is, is so important to us. And so kind of just sticking to those roots as we grow is going to be, is going to be important for sure. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, how do you, what are your guys' favorite trends for this season? So I, yeah, I think, so it's just me because with COVID, you know, things changed overnight. And so I'm just loving how everything right now is just, I mean, I think it goes back to my experience at Calvin too. I just love like the minimal modern aesthetic. I mean, most of what we try to design, we just keep that in mind and, and really that just traditional like core pieces to your wardrobe that every woman should have. I mean, that's what most women that buy our, our turtlenecks, which are our best sellers. Um, you know, we've heard women say constantly, like every woman needs one of these in their closet. It's like a, a, the perfect basic, the perfect outfit builder that you can put, you know, anything can, you can style it with anything. So I would have to say, I'm really glad just to see that coming back. And I think that like with COVID and, and just the times and the, the feel that like you know, this, like, splashy prints and stuff like that, you know, I think it's just all about investing in core pieces for your wardrobe that you know are going to be classic and never go out of style really. And I, you know, I've always thought about my wardrobe in that way. And I still have pieces in my closet from Calvin Klein collection, which is actually no longer, they stopped making Ah, (laughs) Um, So, you know, but I, these, you know, things that I saved from my time there, I still wear and they are, you know, they never go out of style because they're just these beautiful. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm starting to love that that's the feel and just kind of where fashion is looking right now. And, um, you know, I, I, we work really well at home, obviously, but we do like to think of ourselves as an elevated, you know, style that we're not, we're not like a sweatshirt that you throw on to like go to sleep in, you know, like, I mean, you could, like, we really want, like, you can wear our stuff to dinner, you know, like you can wear it out to go meet your girlfriends for lunch um just the same as you could wear it over your gym clothes so i'm just i'm really loving that style right now is feeling tradition you know very classic and kind of hearkening back to that to that time um and i don't know i mean you know i was wearing a lot of like flats during covid because i was home and i even bought like some slippers around the house and now i'm just really over that i want to wear heels again (laughs) I kind of want to start feeling like I even, even though I'm working from home, I'm putting heels on and like my yeah. boots, like I just want to feel dressed up again and I'm like craving but, that. So, yes. but it's still got to be like, it can't be too over the top, you know, it has to be like cool, sophisticated, but yet a little bit elevated, but still comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. When I worked at Ralph Lauren between like 2000 and 2015, we would be taking people through the showroom and talk about this like big trend towards active, active, active. And I feel like that around 2015 started to have this backfire. I mean, everyone still wanted to be comfortable after all this time of dressing that way. But now, yes. how do you take that to the next level so that people can be comfortable but, but look good? Um, look good still. So, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, totally. It's a, great, it's a great slot in the marketplace, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, I think what one other question I had for you was you mentioned a lot of travel, particularly in your previous life. Just wondering if you have any really cool places that you've been that, that fashion has brought you to. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, going to South of France previous, you know, in my old life in my old corporate world was just, those were experiences of a lifetime. I went to South Korea also for a Calvin Klein oh. event at one point. Um, I, so now with our company, we, we've been out to the West Coast. We've been to San Francisco a few times. That's a big market for us. Um, we actually have done pop-ups in Nantucket the past few summers also, cool. which is another just like on brand, you know, resort vacation place um, that we love and have gone to since we were children. So, um, you know, we've, we've gone there for those pop-ups um, in the summers. And, um, but yeah, I would say, you know, going out to the West Coast has been really fun pre-COVID, you know, before travel has been a little bit um, restricted. But you know, the minute we can safely travel, you know, again, I think that 
California, um, Chicago, we went to Chicago as well. Um, those are just, we have our, actually, um, Illinois became one of our top selling states last year. I think because we went to Chicago and we were doing some, you know, marketing there. Um, so yeah, so it's, you know, it's kind of about looking at those different cities and where we fit in as a brand and, and targeting them. And so as soon as, you know, things can open up a little bit, like I'm sure those will be places we'll be going back to and kind of looking at it in a different way and in a bigger way, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And do you have your eyes set on opening any more locations or are you? We do, yes. So we we were, we're kind of looking at this um, at the store in Greenwich that we opened as a test to see, okay, can we do this? Uh, you know, what is the setup? What is what does it take to run a store? You know, our own store. So, um, and the first month has been great. So, if, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. but, um, yeah, it's it's gone well. So we're we're looking at as a test to kind of test the market and see, you know, how does this work and what are the things that are making it work or not work and how do we make them better? Um, so I think after, you know, this, these three months have come and gone and we are through the holidays, we'll kind of look at that and then think about where we would go next. I mean, you know, retail has obviously changed so much. And I think COVID, I read an article um, last week that said COVID did to the retail industry what six years would have done. So in six months, it's, and it might get worse. Like other people will go to business and other companies yeah. will file, file for bankruptcy and it's insane. And, you know, shopping in, in store is, is going to be a different experience. And I think that brands will think about retail locations in a much different way. And especially for us, you know, um, 90% of our sales are through our website and 10% are, are, are wholesale. So, you know, yeah. we, and now that will change as we have our, in our own store, we'll see what that, you know, percentages, but it's, um, it will, it will be a small percentage because it's just a small store, you know, for now it's a small store, but, yeah. but, um, but so, you know, when you think about what that means for us as a brand and where we would open a retail store, it would be all for the quote unquote marketing of it. Like what city do we want to be in to, you know, get to more people, reach more customers, um, you know, and, and, and how will, what will be successful and what will make it, you know, so that a customer in that city can go and experience our brand and see what we're about and get their right size and all that. You know, it's, I don't think it's necessarily going to be about, you know, making the sales in that store anymore. I think that brands are going to start thinking about it in a much different way. Yeah. Um, well, I guess my parting question for you before I turn it over to students would just be what piece of advice you have for someone who's looking to launch their own business? So my, our, my, the best advice that we got was to, you know, start small and have a great marketing story. And, you know, I think the, the coolest thing about now in the time that we're living in is that, you know, 10 years ago, the number one get of a new company, a new fashion company was, you know, to land in all the fashion spreads and pages. And, and that's not to say that's not a big deal, but you know, with social media now, you can start your own media company. Like you can have your own media outlet where you control the message, you speak to your customers, you know, you're, you have, you build your own sort of community where you're, you know, getting your product out. And so, it, you know, it's just, it's a really interesting time to launch a company. And I think if, you know, you're going to do it, I think that having the story, knowing what your marketing plan is, having a business plan, of course, but, um, but just knowing, you know, what, where, who, what you stand for and being consistent with that from the get-go. I mean, whether you have a hundred Instagram followers or 500,000, your followers are there for a reason and they're following you because they want to see a certain thing. So, yeah. you know, if, you have, if you're coming out with it, you know, launch the product. Don't, like I saw one company launch and they, it was a swimwear company and they had launched with like all these beautiful pictures of like um, vacation destinations and, and scenic shots of like yachts and whatever, like very aspirational images. And then all of a sudden they launched and it was like a bathing suit. And you're like, wait, <laughs> that's not what I came here for. I came here for the beautiful like escapism. And so you really have to tell your story, you know, launch with your story, what your product is. Yeah. Speak to, you know, who you are. And, and don't lose sight of that over time. Because I think, you know, it takes a while to build up trust and awareness, brand awareness, and 
getting your, your message out there. It doesn't happen overnight. So it's really important to stick with, with the messaging that you started with in the very beginning. Yeah, that's great advice. I love that. <laughs> well, great. Um, students, uh, does anyone have any questions? Please raise your hand. Sharon, do you want to ask your question live? <laughs> Unfortunately, well, I have a uh, torn um, ACL, and I'm not looking fabulous, so I've wrapped up on the camera. Um, <laughs> I've got cushions and ice packs, and it's, it's not a good look. But I would just ask, if you don't mind, um, off camera, um, as a student, sort of starting out without that um, fabulous pre-career, post-new career, um, how, how, did you, how did you go about locating your product line sources locally? Um, just, you know, okay, here I have my idea, I have my, my message, I have, I'm ready to lie, you know, I've got my Instagram up with my sample and then how do I find people that aren't you know 3,000 miles away to set that up and is that one of your pieces that you're wearing right now yes yes it's, it's very it's it's great I, I want one I'll get Thank on you. one right after this <laughs> but um <laughs> in the intro like how, how you know I'm on the I'm I'm, I'm in New York um so I don't know how how is there like a yeah so a I would, warehouse a listing of yeah I would say um, try makersrow.com and you have to pay thirty five dollars a month and it is worth it I think it's worth every dollar um, and they have tons of uh, production resources um, and I think what you know the best thing to do is just to reach out to as many as you can and like. I don't know if people would like take in-person meetings or not, but you know, you could even just send your sample to them for a day and see, you know, see what they think and if they could make it. Um, and, you know, I think it's just all about contacting as many factories and Makers Row also does a good job of like narrowing down what they do and what they specialize in. So depending on what you're making, you can kind of search from there and see, you know, what, what you can find. Um, and then honestly, like good old fashioned Googling. <laughs> And just you know whatever you're trying to make and just google email call um and just try to set up you know a phone call or even an in-person meeting if it's possible to kind of present your idea and, and show your samples um i think that way and i think also during normal times um they have a lot of uh fabric you know trade shows um in New York City, I, I they probably aren't happening this year because I know that the, there's one called the Functional Fabric Fair, which I believe has been canceled this year. But they have a great website as well, and um, that those are amazing resources. All of those like fabric trade shows, you know, you can go for free. You don't even some of them you don't even need to register. You just show up and like give your ID and they let you in. And um, and you know they have vendors from everywhere. You know local vendors to overseas vendors, and um, and we would go in and meet with you know, anyone and everyone and just pull fabric swatches and have, you know, buttons and zippers. Like there's all sorts of, of people there that are selling all sorts of things. So that's a great resource too. And then also the fashion district, which I'm sure everyone knows, but um, we spent a lot of time there too, just kind of like going for inspiration and, and hardware things and, and any sort of like construction items. We I was up and down 37, 38th street um, a lot in the beginning of launching our company. So. Um, I would say that's another good place to go as well, but I don't know if that helps. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> you said fabric row, R-O-W? Um, so functional fabric fair was one of the trade shows that we've been to often. And then makers row. M -A makers, I'm sorry, R-O-W. Yes. And you I'm, have I'm writing in a highlighter yeah. so I can't see right now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Makers row, M-A-K-E-R-O-W-S.com. And you pay thirty-five dollars a month, and it's a, a lot of a lot of information and, and resources, also. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Muriel, I think you have your hand up. Hi. Thank you for being here today. Um, I love your brand. I love that it's made in U.S. and with a sustainable fabric. So. 
That's amazing. Um, and my question is about something I was doing over the weekend, which was um, sizing up a pair of pants from a 26 to a 30. And as I was doing this, I realized that sizing actually varies so much across brands and that then I was thinking about that question everyone says, like, who's your customer? And I realized that if you're a brand, like when you ask that question, you also have to decide like what your customer's body proportions are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. because you need to decide like what that standard fit model is and then size it up from there. And so I guess I have two questions. Um, the first is like, how did you find your customer? And then also from there, like how did you decide on what that body type was for your samples? So this is such a good question. Um, and it's something we talk about daily. <laughs> it's so, Yes, so I actually um, was the fit model. I have been the fit model um, often. I am a probably like close to a standard size four. So, you know, but as you said, like so many bodies are, there's so many different body types. I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible to design something that will go from a size, you know, zero, double zero to even plus sizes. Like it's just, it's, it's really, really difficult. So. Um, and we learned that, you know, early on that people would buy our stuff and like, you know, we'd hear back from customers, women that would say, you know what, the arms are too tight. And I would think, oh my God, well, I do have like skinnier arms. So maybe that's like, like why they're too tight. And so then we've over time tried to compensate for that as well. So, um, it's, so I guess like I, I was going to quote the customer, right? Cause I was the fit model and we would grade our for production, you grade every size up and down um, to the different sizes. Um, but we, you know, it's it's a constant, um, in, you know, just trying to improve on fit and sizing and and how we communicate our sizing. I think, you know, that's a big part of it too. Is is making sure you have the right size guide and fit guide and and information for your customer, especially if you're an online brand. Like you just really have to put as much information as you can up on the website that you have um, just to make it that much easier for them to decide on style, sizing, and then also to try to reduce your return rate on the on the other end of it. So, um, you know, I think that over time, what we've also done is our, so our Cobble Hill turtleneck is, is our flagship style. It's got a funnel neck and it fits longer. It, it goes below your butt and it has pockets and it's like just a really cute little top that can go with leggings or like skinny jeans. Um, and it, um, I would say that we've come out with other styles that serve the same purpose that will work for other body types. So like we came out with a parks, a turtleneck that we call the park slope turtleneck that's shorter fitting for women that are shorter because they said they couldn't even wear the cobble hill is too long. Um, we actually just launched an in-between length of that. So we, we kind of took our best selling style and we continue to improve on it and add more like options of it for different body types, if that makes sense. So, you know, it's kind of like once you have a style that, you know, women want, like if you come out with a, a jean, you know, denim that it's like the best fit on this type of body type. Okay. How do we take that and then just like tweak it for another body type and keep our core product for that customer, but you know, make something that another customer might also want to wear so that even though you have a short torso or long torso for our turtlenecks, you can find the right length on our website that, that serves the same purpose as these other styles. So, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of listening to your customer and, you know, all of the customer feedback we get is just so valuable and we constantly are searching for it and we, our customer service team, you know, we try and we, you know, try to get as many updates with like negative feedback, positive feedback that we can so that we can take that and just get better at, you know, finding styles that will kind of work with, with all body types. Um, and, you know, just it's I think it's really about how you communicate it too, and, and just making sure that customers have as much information possible, you know, on your website when they're shopping. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, Mary Kate Callahan, I have you next. Hi. So um, with running your own company, you obviously have so many different responsibilities. I was wondering about like, have you had any advice on like time management or any like, you know, 
just advice on like how to better like manage your time because like obviously you're overwhelmed with so many different like um, obligations like how do you like section it off or is there stuff you've used like just over your whole life to manage your time best yes so um I would find so I actually it's funny that you asked this because um, I recently have been, I started waking up at 5.30 in the morning, which is like, not like me. My husband even has been commenting on it. He's like, you're so sprightly in the morning. And I was like, I have to get up and like get stuff done in the morning or the whole day goes by and you just, you haven't answered, you know, 10 emails that you wanted to answer. So um, I've been waking up in the morning early. I try to wake up and read um, as much as I can in the morning. I read Women's Wear Daily. I read Business of Fashion. I you know, go through Instagram, look at whatever news or whatever's going on in the fashion world, um, mostly. And then, um, and then I try to get a quick workout in. And then I like literally when my day starts, it's just it, as most people, especially if you're a student, like, you know, there's just so many things going on during the day. And like, if you're, if you feel like you're, well, for me personally, if I feel like I'm behind on stuff, I, it gets, makes me feel more stressed. So you know, I have to feel like I am somewhat organized um, throughout the day and waking up early has really helped just get my mind into a better place. And and even if I sit down, even if it's like 6.30 a.m. and I sit down and I do a to-do list for the day, oh my gosh, like it changes the whole day. And I just, you know, I, I block out time. Um, I actually have this and I, I don't even know, I couldn't even tell you where to buy this, but it's called Here's the Plan. It's, I bought it off some website and it's, you know, you could make this on your own, but it basically lays every day and I every Monday morning I write out each day and what I'm doing each day and the calls and so you know and I actually do on one side I do work stuff and then on the other side I do personal stuff so like the kids schedules or even like if I have a doctor's appointment or whatever so that's on the right side so I have that and then I also have a to-do list so on in my notebook which this is a not a good notebook my nice notebook was used up so this is like a little CVS one but um, I do on the right side, I do my work stuff that I have to do. And on the left side, I have my personal. So I think it's, you know, something that helps me keep my mind in, in one place is just really differentiate between what's going on in my personal life and what's going on in work. And okay, what do I need to get done? And also accepting that not everything will get done, which is really hard for, for myself to accept. And I think I've tried to get better at that, you know, over time, but um, you know, and, you know, accepting that not everything's going to get done in a day and also being present in the thing that you're doing, whether it's taking an online class or going to the kids swim lesson, like so for those 20, 30 minutes or an hour or whatever, try not to multitask. Like I know we're in this digital world where I could literally sit here and text someone while I'm talking to you, but I'm not going to be fully present on whatever else is going on. So you know, having these lists and scheduling and, and calls and, you know, scheduling time with people, even though it might be on Zoom or whatever, and just, you know, being present in those slotted times for those people and those calls, I think is, you know, I'm not always perfect at it, but I think it's just so important. And I think being present and fully focused on the person or the task at hand is just, is so important. So lists, being present. <laughs> I'm waking up early. That's that's the best advice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All very good advice, I think. <laughs> um, since I am not, I'm on my iPad and not in teacher mode. I can't necessarily see if anyone's raising their hand. Are there any other uh, questions? Does anyone else have a hand up? I'll throw in the chat. I'm not seeing it. I'll just chime in. This has been very helpful and informational. And I uh, appreciate it. I, I said I, I found this to be very helpful and informational and inspiring. So glad. Thank you so much. It's really great to hear that. Well, great. Thank you so, so much for being here today. And I apologize so much for my technical difficulties. Every, oh, no problem. You know, I'm sitting here and everything's working perfectly. And then, of course, as soon as we start, things <laughs> go wrong. But, um, yeah. Really excited to hear what's going to come in the next year with Deadly Stevens. We're going to be following along, and Thanks. we love hearing from you today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, Carrie. Thank you. All and right. guys, um, I have emailed you a survey for today's attendance, uh, so you can get the email there. Um, just give me a shout if you're not getting it, but otherwise, it's there. And Lauren, have a great afternoon. Thank you.
Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Sorry, I have a question. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so I um, sent you my lecture questions, but I was confused about like the format for how I submit the answer. Do I go back into my Word doc and then just write in the answer and email it to you again? Yes, yeah. that's ideal. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Professor, have you, um, this is, have you, I just want to make sure, have you been getting my lecture prep questions? Your lecture questions. Yeah, I would have graded them if I got them. Mm. Have you not seen a grade? Um, let me double check real quick. Do you mean your attendance questions or do you mean your? Um, the, oh, I think the attendance ones, the ones that you do at the end of class. Yeah, yeah, yeah I have. You'd know if I hadn't because it would be, you're, you would have bad attendance. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I believe I'm good from what I see. Yeah, it says 100, so I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, thank you. No problem. Bye. Hi. Anyone else have questions out there? I actually have a question. What, sure. Oh, because I wasn't sure. I did look at attendance. It's Sharon. Hi. Um, did I plug in late one day or something? Is that what that is? It... Viola has 100. <laughs> Um, if there is something, if your grade is not 100, it's either because of an absence or because of a lateness. All right. Well, I haven't been absent, but it must been, I must have plugged in late one day or something. You can click in and see your whole attendance record. So if you think that something doesn't jive, then you can, you can? Have, you know, yeah, you should be able to see your, your, if by day, I mean, I have a different view than you guys, but, um, I believe it would you would just hit your attendance on the left nav of um, Blackboard. You might stay there one one second. I'm just curious because I, I've never wait uh, faces and places. Okay, content. Okay, um, grade, and then attendance. Wait, it's doing something. No, it doesn't tell me. It just gives me an overall. Okay, let me see. Let me see if there's a setting. But it said present zero, late zero, app zero, and excuse zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. I mean, it, it, I, I wasn't sure if it was cumulative how that hundred gets there or whatever. It is cumulative. I have um, an attendance record on mine. I don't know why you wouldn't be able to see it. Let me fiddle around and see if there's like a setting I can change. Um, for you in, in particular, if you want me to say, uh, it was October 7th that you had a lead. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So there was, there was a late. It doesn't show it here. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be late. <laughs> That's okay. Life happens. It's really happening very quickly. I did um, tear it, blow out my knee, and it's really unpleasant. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. So dumb. I mean, exercising. All right. <laughs> I won't do that anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. See you next week. Bye bye.